Well, thank you. That was a very nice introduction. They tell me that I have to hold this close to my mouth in order. Can you hear me now? It feel, sounds like the Verizon. Is that Verizon commercial? Uh, well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here on a Saturday afternoon and very happy to see you all here on a Saturday afternoon. I see many friends. Uh, I want to give just a very brief acknowledgement to the folks from the Lyceum, one of the great schools uh, anywhere, I think, in the United States. I was uh, just mentioning that I debate very often at law schools and uh, universities and been doing so for about 20 years. Um, I've been at you know, Harvard, my alma mater, Cornell, uh, University of Chicago, you name it, all across the board, UCLA, USC, every, every place. And um, a lot of very bright people there who ask very intelligent questions. And this is not an exaggeration. I spoke recently at the Lyceum and the students there are all you know, they're all undergrads, right? They're all high school or middle school kids. The, the questions I got there were the most erudite I had ever gotten. It was astonishing. Harvard Law School can't compete. <laughs> the subject matter of my address is threats to religious liberty with a subcomponent that has to do with life issues and in particular, life issues with respect to the black community. It sounds as if there isn't a direct correlation between those things, but I'll try to draw it together and I think you'll see that there is. Um, I am a member of the US Commission on Civil Rights. I've been a member for 17 years, the longest serving commissioner. And the reason I mentioned the length is because it's important to see the trajectory of threats to religious liberty that have occurred just in the last 17 years. And those threats are building and profound. Uh, the Civil Rights Commission and service they're on is similar to being a canary in the coal mine. You get to see the things that are happening in the culture well before their visit upon the general population. The new ideas and the fads that many who are secularists want to try out, possibly put into legislation, are first tried out at the Civil Rights Commission. We have hearings on a whole manner of things, everything related to denials of equal protection. And as a result, we see every emerging cultural issue you can imagine. And the trajectory, I'm sorry to say, at least in my estimation, others may dispute that, is not a good one. It's a negative one, and it's a very threatening one. The threats to religious liberty come from a number of different vantage points. The government is one great threat to religious liberty. Academia, another significant threat. Businesses, perhaps because of compliance with governmental mandates or a capitulation to the vagaries of the popular culture. And then, we've got the culture. And the culture may be the greatest threat because it's an insidious threat. We don't necessarily see the emergence of the threats pursuant to the culture right away. It's very subtle. I know the folks from the Lyceum will know this, but you remember that Alexis de Tocqueville back in the 1820s talked about democracy in America and his observance of the culture. And one of the things he said is, the species of oppression by which democratic nations are governed is unlike anything which ever before existed in the world. It does not tyrannize, but it compresses, enervates, extinguishes, and stupefies a people until each nation becomes nothing more than a flock of timid animals of which the government is the shepherd. And that's the kind of prescient observation that is right now being exhibited in almost every arena imaginable. There is a militant secularism on the march that will extinguish, if we don't fight back, the preservation of life and all life issues, ranging from abortion to the newest fads with respect to denial of human, uh, human exceptionalism and assisted suicide which will soon morph into a duty to die, as in many places it already has become in Europe. 
I don't know if we've talked about that or in any other circumstance here there was, there's been any uh, talk with respect to assisted suicide and the duty to die, but in many places in Europe now, what used to be thought of some type of beneficent assistance to those who are in dire pain and are on the verge of dying and physicians would maybe assist them in dying has now become, as we had predicted, a duty to die if you are infirm and are a burden on your family and or the state or you're gonna be dying soon, so what the heck, let's save some money and some bed space by helping this person on his final passage. We always think that it can't happen here in the United States, but that's mistaken. It can happen, and we're starting to see it in certain places, and I'll talk about it in a moment. So, because I was a little alarmed at what I saw in several hearings at the Civil Rights Commission, by the way, the Civil Rights Commission consists of eight individuals who are appointed by either the president or the majority leader of the House and Senate. Right now, the commission consists of six people who I will term, uh, uh, characterize as secularists, and two people, I hope I'm included in that, who um, understand that America's first freedom was religious freedom. I was concerned at the path we were following, especially at the governmental level, and with the advent of Obamacare, which was a great threat to religious liberty and a great threat to life, even though it was supposed to be a health care bill, a significant threat to life. So using the mechanisms of the commission, I prevailed upon even the liberal majority on the commission to hold a hearing that was titled Peaceful Coexistence. It was the coexistence of non-discrimination law, which most of us think is a good thing, and religious liberty, which most of us think is a good thing. But very often, they're at war with one another. So we held this hearing a couple of years ago, and we had numerous witnesses, and they came from virtually every aspect of life. We had professors, we had businessmen, we had lots of students, and they were particularly alarmed. And there was not one student there who was advocating from a secular perspective, saying that there was no threat to religious liberty they were the most apoplectic at the threats to religious liberty. And we had religious there also. We had a number of comments. By the way, the way the commission works is after you have a hearing, there's usually an open record period where members of the public can send in written comments if they weren't able to attend. And we received more commentary for that particular briefing than in any briefing in the history of the US Commission on Civil Rights, which has been in existence since 1957. And remember, the US Commission on Civil Rights, in its first 10 years, was at the fulcrum of the most significant civil rights legislation in the country's history. And we had amazing commissioners, people like Father Theodore Hesburgh of Notre Dame, some, some of the greatest icons of the civil rights movement, and some of the deepest thinkers such as Professor Robbie George of Princeton University. Despite that, and despite the fact that the Civil Rights Commission was one of the primary engines behind the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, the 68 Fair Housing Act, the ADA, you name it, we had more commentary on this particular issue, which I think is an indication of how the public perceived the ongoing and emerging threat to religious liberty. Now, um, I'm not sure where I should begin with this, but I think I'm gonna begin at the very end. At the very end of every hearing, the staff of the commission along with the commissioners will take all of the testimony, all of the written material that's adduced in any given hearing, synthesize it, and come up with a report. And that report goes to Congress and the President, and it's available for the public to see also. This report had, um, it was the report mainly of the majority on the commission, and I wrote a dissent 
um, which is probably longer than the report itself. And it should have been much longer. It was over 100 pages long. And I'm just going to cite for you, and I wrote it down because I couldn't remember it, as I could remember the de, uh, de Tocqueville quote, but it's almost as profound as the de Tocqueville quote, but in a negative way. If I were to distill the findings or the holding of the majority of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights with respect to religious liberty, it comes down to the following sentence, which was, frankly, covered by many in the media and alarmed many bishops wrote in about this, cardinals wrote in about this, were concerned about this. But this is the essence of the finding. What they said, the majority said, was, quote, religious freedom stands for nothing except hypocrisy so long as it remains code words for discrimination, racism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, Christian supremacy, and other forms of intolerance. That's how they view religion. And that's how a significant percentage of the secularists in the country view religion. I talked about a militant hostility to it, a militant secularism. I was stunned, and again, I've, <laughs> I don't want to say I've seen it all, but I see a lot of things at the Civil Rights Commission, but I was really amazed at the hostility to religion evinced by many of the witnesses. And this statement is consistent with what many of the witnesses stated during the hearing. There was one witness, a professor, who said that religion was the reason for slavery and the perpetuation of slavery. By the way, I uh, was on C-SPAN Monday to discuss, by the way, if you ever need a cure for insomnia, <laughs> just look at that tape of an hour and a half. It's the landmark cases of the Supreme Court. Um, it was a discussion of the 1883 civil rights cases. I'm supposed to be an expert, but you know, uh, I'm not. I just play one on TV. Well, in the course of that, they have viewers call in. And one of the viewers called in and expressed the same sentiment, said, why is it, by the way, 1883 civil rights cases uh, had a significant religious component to it that many people are not aware, well, clearly this particular caller was not aware of, but most people aren't because we don't teach history anymore. Maybe they do at the Lyceum, but they don't teach it at other places. And people don't read anymore. As I always used to tell my kids, it's amazing what you can learn by reading. And I confound a lot of my opponents in court because I actually read things, you know? It's not that hard. <laughs> but what this caller said, she had a question about this case. 1883 civil rights cases. I'm going to, I'll try to put you to sleep in, in, in less than 30 seconds. The 1883 civil rights cases had to do with the 1875 Enforcement Act that enforced the 13th and 14th Amendments. The 13th Amendment was the one that prohibited slavery. The 14th Amendment granted equal protection to all citizens of the United States, okay? It's famous, there are actually five consolidated cases. It's famous because of this dissent written by one of the justices, Justice John Marshall Harlan. It's an extraordinary dissent. It was wrong legally, but it was a heroic dissent. Nonetheless, this caller said, why is it that so many white people, especially, who are religious, use religion to justify racism and discrimination? Okay? And my response was, and again, this is off the top of my head, I, I, I was a little bit taken aback by this because I was thinking about legal responses, but um, in, in historical responses also. It may be true that whites, blacks, Asians, whomever use whatever vehicle they can or justification to discriminate against somebody, okay? That happens, we know that. But it was astonishing to me that they would point that to that particular issue when, as I said in my response, there would have been no abolitionist movement without the religious, none. The Quakers were the primary motivating force behind the abolitionist movement, the Emancipation Proclamation. Listen, read Abraham Lincoln. Look at the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Again, read. It's an easy thing to do. The people at the Lyceum will tell you this. 
But without the religious, without religion, without a religion or a theology that understands the primacy of man, the exceptionalism of human beings, and that we're all God's creatures, we would have had no abolitionist movement and perhaps for a long time, the institution of slavery would have continued to prevail. And John Marshall Harlan, who wrote the dissent, again, legally wrong, but heroic, but the person who called was a fan of John Marshall Harlan without understanding that what informed his dissent, where he said the 14th Amendment was a positive constitutional right to freedom from discrimination, it was informed by his Presbyterianism. He would be what we call today a fundamentalist Christian. And that's what motivated him, and it's infused throughout his dissent. We have at the US Commission on Civil Rights, which is supposed to protect, among other things, religious freedom, overt hostility, and it's only one aspect of it. And we had a professor who testified that, my goodness, religion is good for very little other than justifying discrimination. Now, at the Civil Rights Commission, and I, by the way, I'll make this a little bit more relevant to the pro-life issue, but at the Civil Rights Commission, we have individuals who have concluded, again, this is the US Commission on Civil Rights. After this report was finished, it went to the Obama administration and it informed the policies of the administration, the laws, the guidances, so on and so forth, the Office of Civil Rights of the Department of Education, the Office of Civil Rights of the Department of Justice. And it informed them in a way that suggested that religion is secondary to principles of non-discrimination. Now, if any of you know your history, or if you know common sense, or if you understand philosophy at all, let's just go from history. Historically, freedom of religion, apparently somebody forgot, I don't know if they're not teaching this anymore, was one of the engines for the establishment of the United States of America. Stunning. We also have a movement afoot where we deny that the founding fathers were at all motivated by religion. They say that they were just deists. Well, a deist is someone who's religious, but that's false. They can say that because, again, nobody reads anymore, especially history. And I won't give you a history lesson. I'm inept at doing something like that. But I think all of you here know that that is fundamentally false. So we have a cohort at the Civil Rights Commission charged with protecting the civil rights of Americans who don't understand that the first freedom was in fact the first freedom. And when I talked about peaceful coexistence of principles of non-discrimination and religious freedom, there's tension there, but it can be mediated by people of goodwill. And I'll get into that in a moment. But the Civil Rights Commission, and as a result, the federal government writ large, takes the position that religious freedom is subordinate to principles of discrimination, and the US Commission on Civil Rights affirmatively said in their uh, report that, well, you just heard what I read. Religious freedom is subordinate to principles of non-discrimination. Principles of non-discrimination take primacy over religious freedom. Five seconds of historical perspective. Religious freedom was the First Amendment, okay? It was the foundational motivation behind the establishment of the United States of America and many aspects of our Constitution. But the 14th Amendment came into existence in 1868, perhaps too late, but still 80 years after the First Amendment. And then all the other non-discrimination statutes came into existence subsequent to that. You had the Enforcement Act that I was just talking about, there was an 1870 Enforcement Act, an 1875 Enforcement Act, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, 65 Voting Rights Act, 68 Voting All these non-discrimination pr principles succeeded that First Amendment. And without that First Amendment, all the other ones are meaningless. I want to give you a few examples for how profoundly, I'm trying to be nice here, stupid, the Civil Rights Commission and much of the government is, but it's more than stupid, it is dangerous. 
Some of these cases I was personally involved in, but most of them I was not. Many of you have probably heard about these cases, but a lot of people are alarmed and stunned when they hear about these things. And these aren't the most significant. Now, many of you here know that there's a case before the Supreme Court called Masterpiece Cake. That's the one where a baker had declined to make a wedding cake for a gay couple. And it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. It'll be decided probably in June of this year. We'll hear about it. But it's going to be decided not so much on the freedom of religion clause in the First Amendment. It's going to be on a freedom of speech clause, or actually kind of an, a takeoff on freedom of speech. I'll put that aside. If anyone has any questions on it later, I'll, I'll answer it. But we've had other cases very similar to that. Give you some examples. Um, but before I do that, let me just say this. If there are any folks here who are pro-life, you can be pro-life without being religious. That is, there's no doubt about that. There's a, a fundamental philosophy undergirding the life issue that doesn't necessarily require a belief in a deity. That's true. You can get that. But it also goes without saying that the entire life movement could not really exist without the religious. So, if you are not concerned about freedom of religion, you should nonetheless be concerned about the preservation of that principle because it's more than freedom of religion. It's freedom of belief, regardless of what that belief may be. And if it's freedom of belief, it means freedom of thought. Because if they can control what you believe, they control what you think, and then they control how you act. That sounds almost like I should be wearing a tinfoil hat, except read history once again. For any of you who have studied closely, any of the philosophers, I mean, the French philosophers, the German philosophers that undergirded communism from Marx, Engels, you name it, you understand that they appreciated the fact that the principal obstacle to totalitarianism is religion, belief in a god. If you don't, but I forgot, you know, the old saying, and I'm going to mangle it, um, the, more than one Russian writer said that if there's no god, anything is permissible or anything is possible. Everyone from Putin to Stalin to Mao to Hitler understood that they needed to extinguish the people's belief in a deity in order for them to rule supreme. This is not the stuff of a tinfoil hat. This is the stuff of, unfortunately, centuries of human experience that we seek to deny. Human beings are flawed, and human beings have got a tendency to act in ways that may be evil. Evil exists in the world, but the smart people deny that. They believe that human agency prevails over all. But again, put aside religion. If they can control how you think, as they did in Lenin and Stalin's Russia, Soviet Union, in Mao's China, they can dictate how you behave. And if we extinguish religion here or suppress freedom of religion, we think it can't happen here. And I think it would be a lot more difficult here for a whole host of reasons. But it wouldn't be impossible. So remember, they can control how you think when I tell you about these cases. And you will see how close it is. It's right around the corner. The first one is the case of Fire Marshal Kevin Cochran of Atlanta. Some of you know about that. I see heads shaking. This is an erudite crowd, see? Fire Marshal Kevin Cochran received all manner of awards for being one of the best fire marshals in the entire country. He received Fire Chief of the Year Award for the entire country. He served as the Chief Fire Marshal for the United States under Barack Obama. He had gotten nothing but exemplary reviews as fire marshal of the city of Atlanta. 
but he made a mistake. He never made any mistakes on the job. Those under him loved him. His mistake was writing a small devotional pamphlet about his religious beliefs. He didn't impose it on anybody. He didn't give it to firefighters under his charge. He didn't do any of that. It was simply on his own time, his own time. Unfortunately for him, he confounded the high priests of political correctness by inserting in that devotional something that maybe 10 years ago would be considered uncontroversial. He simply said that marriage is between one man and one woman. That's all. He didn't excoriate anybody, offend anybody, insult anybody, or even say that marriage is not X, Y, and Z. He simply said, this is what marriage is. It was consistent with his religious belief. And a city councilman for the city of Atlanta saw it and was outraged. By the way, outrage is the religion of the day, I think. And he went to the mayor, and the mayor became outraged, and everyone gets outraged, and they start spinning around. You know, it's just it's amazing how outraged they are by this little devotional that 14 people probably saw. And he was fired. He was fired. Now, in December, he won his case. It was a no-brainer. I don't know who the law director is for the city of Atlanta. I don't know who's advising, advising the mayor. And I won't, I won't say what I want to say, but, you know, maybe they should look at another profession. That's just one example. Now think about the implications of that. That's one person. But even though he got his job back, what's the significance of it? The significance is everybody familiar with that case, every public official, public employee in Atlanta or who had read about it is now going to be chilled against acting privately consistent with their religious beliefs. Maybe if you're out there and you go to a pro-life march, Maybe if you're out there and you oppose these billboards we see that are, you know, you've seen some of these billboards. You go to the Washington Pro-Life March, and if one of these days, even though it's the biggest march in the country every year, ABC, CBS, NBC, and all these others deign to cover it, maybe somebody sees you there, goes to the boss and says, that person was at the Pro-Life March, and you're out the door. He got his job back, but it took two years, and I don't know how much in legal fees. So everybody makes a calculation. Do I want to be the next Kevin Cochran? And the secularists know that. They're banking on it. Another one that we treated at the Civil Rights Commission had to do with, and I had to write this one down because I forget these things. It was Julia from Eastern Michigan. Julia, Julia, Julia. Julia Ward was a counselor at Eastern Michigan University. Anyway, long story short is she was approached by a student to do counseling and she told the student that her religious beliefs were such that she didn't think that she could effectively counsel someone who was thinking about being in a same-sex marriage, okay? But refer that person to somebody who could. Julie got fired, okay? for exercising her religious beliefs in, frankly, a non-controversial way. She didn't tell this person, well, they should reconsider or anything like that. She simply declined to offer her services. She gets fired. I don't know where that stands right now yet. I don't know that there's been any kind of a determination. There has been close to a determination on the next one. Again, this has to do with Georgia. I don't know what's going on in Georgia. But a doctor, in Georgia, and let me find his name again, I have so many names I sometimes forget, it was a doctor, I don't remember his first name, but it was Dr. Walsh. Sterling credentials. He was considered to be a superstar in the public health field and he was hired and he was considered to be a catch by the Georgia Department of Health. They were ecstatic that they were able to lure him away from I think it was somewhere in California but before he actually began the job, someone happened upon, he happened to be a Seventh-day Adventist and a minister. 
and he'd had taped sermons, and somebody happened upon it at the Georgia Department of Health, one of the uh, higher-ups, and saw that, again, he gave a sermon in his private capacity to parishioners in which he simply said non-controversial statements about what he believed in terms of what marriage is. They withdrew the offer about after they heard the sermon. That's currently in litigation. Another one, just, just another one, this is one I was involved in also. A couple of years ago, the mayor of Houston had proposed and the city legislature of Houston had drafted a bill, a lot of these bills are proliferating across the country, that would have permitted men to use women's bathrooms and vice versa. So if you believe that you're a woman, you're permitted to use a woman's bathroom and vice versa. The principal resistance to that bill came from clergy and a lot of parents who said, I don't want my five-year-old girl in a bathroom with a 35-year-old biological male. There was considerable resistance to it, but mainly in the pulpits of the various churches throughout Houston. We are in the United States of America. Remember this when I tell you the following. This is the United States of America. Houston is what, the fourth largest city in the United States? The mayor of Houston ordered her law department to subpoena the sermons of the pastors in Houston to see whether or not they were opposing this ordinance. Regardless of whether or not you approve of the ordinance, oppose the ordinance, to subpoena using the instrumentalities of governmental law enforcement and perhaps the most effective instrumentality of law enforcement, a subpoena, to get the sermons of private pastors. Well, when I heard about this, of course, I got a little excited and I wrote excoriating letters down to the, the Houston mayor and to all of the newspapers down there. Bottom line is, she backed off. But to even attempt that, these pastors don't have the resources of the city of Houston. They can't oppose the city of Houston law department or the Houston uh, police force if they are seeking to execute those subpoenas. They sought to suppress religious freedom in the most fundamental way. Extraordinary. You would think that that was something that came from the old Soviet Union. I have other examples, but I think I'll, I just wanted to give you a sense for, it's right around the corner, it's happening and you don't hear about it. And I hear not just two or three examples, not just dozens, but hundreds. One of the reasons you may not hear about it is because I mentioned the culture. Our media is sympathetic to the Houston mayors of the world to the cities of Atlanta. They don't report these things. I see them all the time. You may not, but I see them because they come as complaints or reports to the Civil Rights Commission. But they're happening in our backyard. And they are happening with much more frequency, and that's why I had asked for this hearing. And those who had been on the receiving end of some of these things were the ones who sent in commentary or asked to be witnesses. And not everyone can be a witness, of course. There's only a finite amount of time. So all these things are occurring. And again, I return to the chilling effect of all these things. Maybe nobody went to jail, but people had to expend tens of thousands. Some people went into bankruptcy protecting their most fundamental rights against the encroachment of the government. Astonishing. I'll give you one more example because it's pertinent to the Supreme Court case that will be decided soon. I think it was Angela's Flowers um, in Washington State. This is a person, it's very similar to Masterpiece Cake, who had been um, supplying flowers to this person who was what she considered to be a friend in the state of Washington. For nine years, on a regular basis, flowers for all manner of occasions. And then the person came in and said, I want flowers, I want you to uh, prepare an arrangement for my wedding, it was a same-sex wedding. And the proprietor took the woman by the hand and said, you're my close friend, you're a dear friend, you know I love you so. 
but I can't do this because it's against my religious beliefs. Ask me for flowers for anything else, any other thing you want, and you have them. Or I can refer you to other places that might do this. Now, the person who had asked for the flower arrangement originally didn't want to sue because that person was acting in good faith and she knew it and they were friends. But as what you see happens almost all the time, someone found out about it, a busybody, and contacted the ACLU, who then contacted the state of Washington and they prevailed upon this person to sue. Now, there are a number of these kinds of lawsuits throughout the country. You don't hear about them. But there are people whose businesses are imperiled because of this. And others who are nearby, there's a chilling effect that happens. They decide not to do it. I'll give you one more because I have so many of these. Vermont. There was a couple who had a bed and breakfast, their own house. This is their own house. Keep that in mind. They had a bed and breakfast, and they opened it to everybody. And they didn't care who it was. You could be, you know, Muslim, Catholic, Jew. You could be homosexual, heterosexual. They didn't care. But there was a couple who wanted to use the premises for a same-sex wedding. And the proprietor said, again, that's against our religion. You can stay here. You can do anything you want to here. But we can't honor the request for a same-sex wedding. And of course, then, the militant police of the state of Vermont, I'll fast forward, came down on them like a ton of bricks. Now, they finally dismissed the case, but not before they required the couple to open up their home, ensure that they would open up their home to anyone who is same-sex. Now, they didn't necessarily have to perform a same-sex wedding there, although that's kind of unsure, but here's what they had to do as a condition of continuing to operate their business. Remember, this is their premises, this is their property. They could not say anything to their guests at any time about their position on marriage. Consider that. In your own home, you can't tell guests in your own home what your position is on an issue that you believe is a religious issue. That's in the United States of America, and it's coming to a theater near you. So if they control your religious beliefs, they can control how you think, and pretty soon, because of the culture, we're seeing an erosion of religion, and that is the bulwark to life issues. Now, I know I only have a few minutes, so let me go back to how this impacts life issues, and particularly in the black community. A couple stats. Abortion is horrific and there are too many, but it's extraordinary the fact that in the black community, nearly one out of every two pregnancies ends in abortion. Nearly 40% of all abortions in the United States, despite that blacks constitute 14% of the population, 40% are performed on black women. 78% of planned parenthood, planned parenthood clinics are within walking distance of a minority community. And there's a reason for that. Think back to the eugenics movement. It's very uncomfortable. You know, all the secularists, all the smart people, the New York Times people, oh, they huff and puff about this. They don't want you, they won't even write about it. But if, if somebody mentions it, they, they, they start to shake their heads and harumph and harumph. But it's true. Again, read. The eugenics movement, where Margaret Sanger wanted to extinguish undesirables, who she typified as brown and black people, that was the progenitor to Planned Parenthood. An uncomfortable, as Al Gore would say, an inconvenient truth. But it's true. 78%. How many of you are familiar with the Gosnell abortion clinic? OK, many of you are. I bet you had to dig and scrape to find information about that in the major media, correct? Here's some news for you. He's not alone, but nobody reports about it. You will hear about some crazy, deranged, evil person who decides, for reasons unrelated to religion, to shoot up an abortion clinic, and it will be wall-to-wall -wall coverage, but you'll never hear 
when you have a guy's no. Did you make the front page of the Cleveland Plain Dealer? No. Not even in Philadelphia. Not at all. It's suppressed. We hear about it. Many of you who are interested in this hear about it. Nobody else hears about it. The urgency of this cannot be understated. Now, why is it important? Because in many states, there are unconstitutional attempts by the state to compel people like you to tell others about abortion clinics and the availability of abortion. In California, crisis pregnancy centers must, by statute, tell women who come to them for assistance about nearby abortion clinics, give them the address, the phone number, and the availability of the services. Compelled speech. Compelled speech is unconstitutional, except in the narrowest of terms. This is blatantly unconstitutional. But where does it happen? 78% of these clinics are in walking distance of black neighborhoods. This is almost extermination of black babies. It's astonishing. If you are a member of the Klan, if you are the most inveterate racist, you should be smiling from ear to ear at what the state of California is doing. And these are the people who will virtue signal all day long about their identity politics with respect to blacks and Hispanics and everybody in the world. That everybody else is a racist except for them. Except when it comes to where the rubber meets the road. Black babies are being extinguished on an industrial scale. It's not just black babies. It's white babies, Asian babies, Hispanic babies. And it's also the elderly. We are at a very, very dangerous point in this country. And if we have a continued erosion of religious liberty, and again, it's very subtle, it will end up where we have no true bulwarks or defenses if you are pro-life. Too many sanctions are able to be imposed in a way that will chill and prevent those of us who are involved in life issues but need to feed our families. It's too much to ask. Numbers mean something. And in a country of 320 million people, when you have the entire secular media, Hollywood, government arrayed against you, a few people few strong people we know in history can do things, but it's a lot easier if you can marshal the forces of the masses, but the masses are standing down because they're fearful of what will happen. I know some of you who have gone to college recently know what it's like in academia. There is an aggressive hostility to religion if there's even an acknowledgement of religion at these institutions. It's being wiped clean to the extent where you could have, as I said, that professor sitting at a US Commission on Civil Rights hearing and say falsely that religion was the underpinning to slavery. Stunning. And people who will be the leaders of this country are sitting in those classrooms and listening to this. So I have a lot more to say, but that was just a small digest of the threat that we face and why threats to religious liberty go beyond merely the freedom to worship, but affect every single life issue from A to Z. I'll stop there and take your questions.